Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Humanities Forum. I gotta tell you what it is first, right? It's an initiative of the Humanities Program, and it's an opportunity for all y'all to engage regularly in the intellectual life outside of class, to deepen your appreciation for the humanities, the humanities, how to be able to say that word, right? And to explore diverse perspectives from on and off campus. This is our third form of the semester, but it will not be the last. So a week from now, for example, an MD PhD will dig into the intersection of medicine and literature. And then the second week of October will feature a professor from Harvard speaking on what it was like to watch ancient Greek drama. So keep your eyes peeled for all that. Uh, for those of you who are new here, the structure runs as follows. First, you'll close your electronics because you want to be, you're here because you want to be present to the event, to your neighbors, not a distraction to them. Secondly, our guest who I'm about to introduce will speak for about 35 to 45 minutes. Then we have a Q&A, and who has to ask the first question in, Q in a Q&A? Kelly, I know you know this. A student. a student has to ask the first question. That is the sacred tradition. We're not departing from it today. Um, at the end of Q&A, oh, but, so your hands will go up, but then wait for the microphone to, to reach you so that your words can be captured for future generations watching on YouTube. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll rise up en masse and head down the hallway to the great room where there's a reception. And, and then the weekend has begun. So today it's our great pleasure to welcome Professor Arshep Melnick, who's a professor of American politics at Boston College and who's the co-chair of the Harvard Program on Constitutional Government. And he holds both a BA and a PhD from Harvard. Professor Melnick is one of the country's leading scholars on law and the courts with books about environmental regulation, the interpretation of welfare rights, the transformation of Title IX, so gender equality in education. And his most recent book is entitled The Crucible of Desegregation, The Uncertain Search for Equal Educational Opportunity. In addition to his scholarly work, he's also served as an elected member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives. So he's gotten his hands dirty. He's not just a theory man. His talk today is made possible by a generous grant from the Jack Miller Center as part of their Constitution Day programming. And I have some very small, very portable, and very beautiful copies, uh, pocket editions of the Declaration and the US Constitution that all start circulating during the Q&A period at the end of Professor Melnick's talk. And so I encourage you to take one home, you know, weigh it in your palm, peruse its 60-ish pages, and consider that this small collection of printed words has served to launch and guide what is arguably the most powerful and most free nation the world has ever seen. With that, I turn the mic over to Professor Melnick. Please give him a warm welcome. It's on. Thank you, Ian. Um, it's a real honor to give the Constitution Day talk uh, uh, here and to see how many people have shown up on a really nice Friday afternoon. So I appreciate it, and I hope I uh, prove to be worthy of your attention today. Um, I'm going to talk only for about half an hour because I think that the question and answer is usually the most interesting part of these talks. Um, so I encourage you to ask me challenging questions to uh, disagree with what I say and provide counterexamples. Um, now, I'm gonna, the, this Constitution Day, the Supreme Court is under attack. Many people, especially those in academia, it, uh, at elite newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post, and among Democratic Party officials, um, are outraged at court's recent decisions on abortion, affirmative action, guns, and administrative power. They've not only criticized those decisions, but questioned the court's integrity and its very legitimacy. Some have even proposed limiting the court's authority and packing it with justices who lean to the left. For example, Senator Elizabeth Warren, a former Harvard Law School professor, has proclaimed, and I quote, the Supreme Court has a legitimacy crisis. Its radical justices are imposing their extremist views on the entire country against the will of the American people. Congress must protect our democracy from this rogue court. 
Washington Post columnist Jennifer Rubin has promised, quote, to expose the court's disintegration as a legitimate judicial body and its emergence as a supreme right-wing policymaker. Uh, Harvard Law professor Mark Tushnet recently co-authored an open letter to the Biden administration condemning what he repeatedly called the MAGA, uh, Make America Great Again Justices, those appointed by Trump. He urges the administration, quote, to be guided by its own constitutional interpretation rather than the court's, quote, gravely misguided interpretation of the Constitution. He seems to suggest that the administration should simply ignore Supreme Court rulings with which it disagrees. Representative Cory Bush has gone even further describing Supreme Court as, quote, a cesspool of corruption and a body with a fascist agenda. Uh, Senators Warren, Representative Bush, Massachusetts Sen Senator Ed Markey, and others have co-sponsored legislation that would add four new justices to the Supreme Court, giving President Biden a chance to pack the court with a liberal majority. Now, you might ask, why do they want four justices? Well, right now, the balance seems to be six, six conservatives, three liberals. You add four liberals, you got seven to six, and Biden has majority on the court. So that's pretty transparent. Uh, now, changing the number of justices on the Supreme Court is clearly within Congress's power. But such manipulation of its membership has occurred only once in American history, and that was right after the Civil War. President Biden hasn't gone so far as to call the court rogue or corrupt or fascist, uh, or to support court-packing legislation. Uh, he's understandably disappointed that his administration has lost a number of decisions, um, but he's also won quite a few cases as well. Um, he has said rel relatively enigmatically that this is not a normal court. I'm not quite sure what he meant by that. Um, I wish I should note that as uh, Biden's administration has won a number of cases. I think Paul Heron's going to bring up another case that uh, the, the liberals on the court have won. Um, so calling them uh, a MAGA court or a conservative court is a bit misleading because conservatives are divided on the court and they've all, sometimes the, a few conservatives have broken off and voted with, with the liberals. We'll talk more about that. Now to most of you in this audience, to the uh, younger people in the audience, there will be nothing particularly surprising or even alarming about this. This after all is the politics you've grown up with. Everything is a matter of not just uh, good or bad policy, but dangerous, corrupt, and illegitimate opposition. Uh, the other side is not just wrong, but, um, uh, but somehow um, way out of line. The ordinary rules of conduct and decorum have been discarded in so much of the par politics um, that this doesn't seem particularly unusual. Politics has become no holes barred, a blood sport. Uh, do it to them before they do it to you, as they used to say on Hill Street Blues, a great TV show that all of you have forgotten. Um, now, to those of us a bit older, though, um, these attacks on the Supreme Court are disturbing and even a bit disorienting, especially when they come from law professors like Warren and Tushnet, who I think should know better. Their rhetoric bears an eerie resemblance to Southern segregationist attack on Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and to the uh, they uh, bear striking resemblance to the strident conservative campaigns against the Warren Court's decision on school prayer uh, and rights to the accused. Yesterday it was impeach Earl Warren. Today it is impeach Clarence Thomas. Uh, have those on the left, especially those in law schools, completely forgotten their repeated warnings, their accurate warnings about the importance of respecting judicial institutions and judicial in independence, I fear that is the case. Now, since we live in a democracy, um, the easiest way to, uh, to attack any policy or any court decision is to say it's undemocratic, as Senator Warren has done. At least in the cases of abortion and affirmative action, though, this is a very peculiar claim. Dobbs, the abortion case, simply returned the issue to the political arena, to the political realm where some of us thought it should have been all along. Um, it is now up to voters and legislators to decide about abortion policy at the state level. Under Roe versus Wade, the court prevented voters and legislators from making these decisions, and 
That was undemocratic, not the opposite. The affirmative action case is different. There the court did prevent state schools and private schools from using racial preferences in admissions. But the admissions policy the court struck down were extremely unpopular. Uh, nearly every time racial preferences have been on the ballot, they have lost, even in California. The court prohibited school officials from applying policy that the, court, that the public disfavors. So the argument that these decisions are undemocratic or out of line with public opinion is misleading public rhetoric that can't withstand any serious investigation. Now I want to uh, uh, rush to say that there's nothing wrong about being discontent with Supreme Court decisions, certainly nothing unusual about that, and nothing wrong at all with criticizing the court's ruling. Harsh criticism of the court, coupled with political efforts to reduce its authority, stretched back to the early days of the Republic. Um, President Jefferson disagreed strenuously with John Marshall, when John Marshall was Chief Justice. Um, and the Jefferson administration took a number of steps to reduce the power of the courts. Franklin Roosevelt not only criticized the court, but tried to pack it with justices who shared his reading of the Due Process Clause, and he wanted them to overturn many years of judicial precedent. But President Jefferson's allies soon recognized the danger of impeaching Federalist judges, and Roosevelt's fellow Democrats saw the danger of allowing the president to remake the Supreme Court. Roosevelt's court packing plan uh, strategy died in 1937, only to be exhumed this year by Senators Warren Markey and their allies. Now, to gain some perspective on this issue of what it is appropriate for uh, president and other elected officials to do when they disagree with the Supreme Court, consider the anguish pleas of their fellow progressives halfway around the world. If you are a secular, progressive citizen of Israel, you're taking to the streets to protest Prime Minister Netanyahu's proposals that sharply limit the power of the Israeli courts. These progressives are taking dramatic steps to defend judicial authority and judicial independence. They are convinced that Netanyahu's government efforts to weaken the judiciary will mark the end of liberal constitutional government in Israel. Conversely, if you're on the right in Israel, uh, you're likely to condemn the activist Israeli Supreme Court as inherently anti-democratic as uh, Senator Warren has done. So politics can make some pretty strange bedfellows. Now the cynical might think, well, this is just how politics works. Um, you dress up your arguments in fancy language about the rule of law and judicial independence, but judges are just politicians in, in robes, according to this view. Um, so if you like their policies, um, you'll defend their power. If you disagree with their policies, you'll try to weaken them. Everyone's position would seem to be dependent on, uh, uh, everyone's position on institutional arrangement would seem to depend on policy preferences, nothing more and nothing less. Now it's tempting to adopt this cynical position, especially these days, but I'd maintain it's not just wrong, but it's dangerously wrong. Uh, so to explain why, let me reframe the issue uh, and give a bit more attention to the valid issues on both sides and on both sides of the Atlantic. Americans and Israelis alike pride themselves in living in democracy. A basic rule of democratic self-government is that majorities rule. But we also pride ourselves in being a liberal constitutional democracy. This means that majorities don't always prevail, shouldn't always prevail, especially if they are fleeting or narrow majorities. We must respect individual rights, that's the liberal part, and we must respect the rule of law. That's a crucial part of the constitutional part. Courts are not the only protector of individual rights and the rule of law, but they're certainly an essential one. So in liberal democratic uh, countries, we confront a fundamental tension between our majoritarian and counter-majoritarian institutions, norms, and expectations. To reverse the cynical interpretation that I offered before, behind many contentious policy disputes lies this fundamental constitutional dilemma. So as a result, we need to be wary of leaning too far in either direction. 
Too much judicial power threatens democracy. Too little judicial independence threatens liberal constitutional government. We're always searching for that Goldilocks principle, you know, the just right middle ground. But unfortunately, there's no theory that can tell us what just right is, where it lies. That requires prudence. So within this context, I want to talk uh, uh, about the undeniable fact that the Supreme Court sometimes gets things wrong. Not just wrong, but dangerously wrong, terribly wrong. The two most obvious examples of this are Dred Scott decision in 1854 and Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. The Dred Scott decision declared that African Americans cannot be citizens. It contributed to the polarization that culminated in the Civil War. Plessy versus Ferguson held that se racial segregation is constitutional, and this gave the green light to the spread of Jim Crow throughout the South. Those of you who study constitutional law would probably add Lochner versus New York and Korematsu and Buck v. Bell to this list of self-inflicted wounds. And you can probably come up with many others as well. So what should we do when we think the Supreme Court is wrong? I've taken the title of my lecture from a 1979 uh, article by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Moynihan was one of the greatest senators of the 20th century. He wasn't a judge, though, and he wasn't even a lawyer. He was an astute observer of our constitutional arrangements. This should remind us you don't need to be a judge and you don't need to be a lawyer to have some do some serious thinking about constitutional issues and constitutional arrangements. Thinking institutionally and constitutionally is a responsibility of all branches of government, indeed of all citizens. That's why we have Constitution Day. In his article, Moynihan disagreed with the court's restrictions on aid to religious schools. He offered three strategies for those who think the Supreme Court is wrong. Debate, litigate, and legislate. To those three, I'm going to add one more, probe. That is, see how narrowly that decision can legitimately be interpreted. That's where most people unhappy with court decisions, decisions almost always start. So let me uh, indicate how these four strategies could work when thinking about uh, controversies over abortion, affirmative action, and gun control. At the outset, I want to it's critical to remember a point I alluded to earlier, and that is there's a big difference between court rulings that throw issues back into the political arena and those that withdraw from the political arena and from private choice. Abortion is an example of the former. The Dobbs decision said nothing. I just want to repeat, the Dobbs decision said nothing about when abortion can be allowed or restricted. It simply said that's for states in the, and to some extent Congress to decide. Uh, consequently, action moved very quickly to state governments um, and to a lesser extent Congress. And ironically, so far, the big political winners have been the Democrats because they're closer to public opinion on this issue in most states. In the affirmative action case, in contrast, the court held that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment prevents state universities from using racial preferences in their admissions process. It also held that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits most private schools from using racial preferences in admissions. Remember that the Equal Protection Clause only applies to state action. It applies to the University of North Carolina. Um, it does not apply to Harvard or Providence College. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, though, does apply to private universities that receive federal funds. And that law is uh, quite clear on restricting use of racial preferences. Now, note that this means that Congress could rewrite the Civil Rights Act uh, to give greater uh, uh, realm of activity for racial preferences in admissions in private schools. It's unlikely that Congress will do that soon, but they will have that option in the future. Um, elected officials retain a great deal of uh, influence over civil rights policy because most civil rights policy is based on statutes rather than the Constitution. Uh, now I said the first response of individuals and uh, institutions who disagree with the court is usually to look for a way around it. That's exactly what universities are now doing with court decisions on affirmative action. Let's find proxies for race. Uh, let's use equity statements. Let's get rid of legacy admissions. 
let's eliminate the SAT requirement. Or more commonly, let's leave so much discretion in the hands of admissions directors that no one will be able to know what they're doing. Um, this is what Southern school systems did in the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education. Make everything discretionary. For better or for worse, this is often a very effective strategy for circumventing laws or court rulings. The truth is um, that the Supreme Court has very limited ability to police end runs, subtle evasions, and even outright noncompliance. This is especially true when lower courts and federal agencies disagree with them. Uh, the Supreme Court decides fewer than 100 cases per year. Lower courts and federal agencies decide hundreds of thousands of cases each year. The Supreme Court must rely on these lower courts and these federal agencies uh, to carry out their orders, and many of those officials are much less than enthusiastic about the recent court decisions, which will reduce uh, the extent to which they are carried out in the way, perhaps, that the majority on the court wanted. Further reducing the Supreme Court's control is the fact that many of its opinions are hopelessly abstract and vague. In my recent book on desegregation, I noted that 70 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court has yet to define desegregation with any clarity. Um, this means that lower courts were the primary determinants of what desegregation meant in any particular city. Um, the, the 2023 Bruin case on gun control. Um, in that case, three members of the majority emphasized how little the court had said, how little the court had determined about what states can and can't do on gun control. Um, when it comes to the abortion decisions, what will the court do on abortion drugs? We don't know. Uh, quite frankly, th that issue is a tremendous mess, and it probably will remain that way for some time. Um, uh, a couple of terms ago, the court issued a so-called major questions doctrine that limits administrative discretion. But that major questions doctrine is basically a slogan. It's not a doctrine. Uh, the justices might know a major question when they see it, uh, to uh, invoke uh, Justice Stewart's famous line about what constituted pornography. But when the rest of us are going to keep guessing about what they will determine is a major question. On all these issues, there'd be plenty of opportunities to shape and modify these recent Supreme Court decisions. And if the Democrats win the presidency in 2024, there will probably be more Democratic justices doing that interpretation. Now, in some extreme circumstances, presidents have gone further, not just interpreting decisions narrowly, but making it clear that they would ignore a Supreme Court decision. Um, for example, President Lincoln ignored Chief Justice Connie's ruling uh, that said he could not unilaterally suspend the writ of habeas corpus at the start of the Civil War. During World War II, Franklin Roosevelt made it clear that he would execute the Nazi saboteurs who had been caught on Long Island, no matter what the Supreme Court said. Um, he warned them, don't decide against me because I'm going to execute them anyway. Of course, these took place in wartime, and in wartime's different presidential power is greater than it is in peacetime. Most presidents have taken a less confrontational stance of simply sitting on their hands. Um, in one famous case, uh, President Andrew Jackson allegedly said, um, John Marshall has had his decision, now let him enforce it. Um, and he did nothing to enforce it. Similarly, the Biden Office for Civil Rights is unlikely to act aggressively against schools that maintain racial preferences. Uh, why should you go out of your way to enforce a decision that you think is wrong? Know, however, that presidents sometimes win praise for enforcing decisions with which they disagree. We applaud President Eisenhower for sending troops to Little Rock to enforce school desegregation orders, despite the fact that Ike himself had major qualms about the Brown decision. But uh, President Eisenhower had even greater, greater qualms about letting the governor of Arkansas think he could thumb his nose at the Supreme Court. So at what point does acceptable non-cooperation become despotic defiance? In his comments on the infamous Dred Scott decision, Lincoln distinguished between the particular court order issued by the, the, a court and the constitutional understanding offered by the court to justify it. The President, Lincoln suggested, must 
follow the former. He must follow the court order. But he doesn't need to follow the logic of the decision that the, the, decision that they, that the order is based on. He doesn't have to accept their interpretation of the Constitution. Presidents and members of Congress have a solemn duty to follow the Constitution itself, not what the Supreme Court said the Constitution means. The Supreme Court can't be the sole interpreter of the Constitution, or even perhaps the preeminent interpreter of the Constitution. Uh, it might have a special responsibility to say what the law means, but others need not blindly follow that interpretation. So when you are an official who thinks this court is wrong, how can you respect your solemn obligation to follow the Constitution without dissing the Supreme Court and, in fact, placing yourself above the court? That is the hard choice. That is the dilemma of which there is no clear resolution. And I'm not going to give you an answer to how a president should deal with that. But I am going to say that, fortunately, this problem arises only in relatively rare extreme cases. And there are a vast number of cases, um, I would say all of the cases now before the court, that there are several methods for respecting the court um, and for being true to one's obligation to abide by the Constitution. So the, there are ways out of this dilemma, and I'm going to try to run through some of the ways that we can escape from this most troublesome issue. Um, in the long run, the most promising response to bad decisions is further litigation. This doesn't mean bringing exactly the same court back to, uh, case back to court again, hoping that the court might change its mind. But I should say that sometimes the court does change its mind. Um, the leading example um, is the flag salute cases. In 1941, the Supreme Court said that if a child refuses to uh, salute the flag, he can be thrown out of school. Two years later, or three years later, the court said, whoops, we made a mistake. Um, in West Virginia versus Barnett, they said schools can't throw out a Jehovah's Witness child because he refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. He has a right of conscience that can, must be respected. Uh, to take a less dramatic example, in 1984, the court reversed a major federalism decision it had issued only eight years before. In fact, on average, the Supreme Court overturns two precedents each year. Um, even more frequently, they modify, clarify, and erode other precedents. Consequently, well-organized litigants will probe for weaknesses. They'll chip away at precedents they don't like. That's precisely what the NAACP did so successfully with the Plessy decision on segregation. They eventually prevailed in Brown versus Board of Education. This is already happening with abortion, affirmative action, gun control, and administrative authority. Pro-affirmative action groups will shop for judicial forums likely to be sympathetic to their cause. Judges more favorable to affirmative action, of which there are many, will seek to narrow the Supreme Court's decision. Others, of course, will try to broaden it. The judicial battles over abortion, affirmative action, gun control, and administrative power are far from over. The new phase of these legal battles has just begun. It'll take years before these issues come back to the Supreme Court, by which time there'll be a somewhat different court. Second uh, uh, way of getting around the dilemma is to legislate. Since Congress and the President both have a responsibility to interpret the Constitution, they can and they should push back against decisions they think are wrong. Sometimes this is pretty easy. For example, in 1995, the Supreme Court struck down a federal law banning guns from school zones. The court said, that's not part of the Commerce power. That's beyond Congress's power. So Congress repassed legislation saying that guns that travel through interstate commerce are not allowed in school zones. Almost every gun passed through interstate commerce, so basically um, uh, Congress got what it wanted. Um, problem was solved. Take another example, in the late 1980s, the Supreme Court adopted a narrow interpretation of most employment discrimination provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In 1991, Congress amended the act to reverse all of those court decisions. These days, most civil rights policy, as I mentioned, is based on laws passed by Congress, not the Constitution. So Congress has many, many ch ch chances to modify or even overturn court decisions. Um, Although it's rare, unpopular constitutional rulings 
by the court can be reversed through constitutional amendment. That happened with the 11th Amendment regarding judicial power, the 13th and 14th Amendment regarding Dred Scott and slavery, uh, the 16th Amendment on the income tax, and to some extent, the 24th Amendment on 18-year-olds voting. Um, now, on the abortion issue, state legislatures will obviously be the central forum for post-Dobbs decision making. Some of us think this is where it should always have been. Um, and Democrats have turned out to get great electoral advantage out of this. Their challenge is to write legislation that appeals to the public, where most Americans stand. In some red, red states, Republicans have passed very restrictive abortion laws. It's quite likely that they will pay a political price for this. I suspect they will find themselves in the situation of the dog that finally caught the car. Uh, we'll see if that's true. <laughs> Gun control, too, will be fought out at the state level. Uh, the court has breathed new life into the Second Amendment, but pl left plenty of room, at least so far, for laws that restrict access to guns in a careful and selective manner. Bruin and the other recent cases have laid out only very broad parameters of what is allowable and what is forbidden under the Second Amendment. Now this brings me to my final uh, option, the one stressed by Senator Moynihan, debate. Decrying the Supreme Court as abnormal or corrupt or evil is an easy way to avoid addressing the court's arguments. In almost all of these cases, big controversial decisions in almost all of them on these big controversial decisions, you will find strong majority opinions and strong dissents if you take the time to read them. Uh, if you do, I suspect that you have to admit that there are strong arguments on both sides of these issues. Um, I must say that reading uh, Justice Kagan's dissent in the Dobbs case, I thought that was the strongest argument in favor of Ro Roe versus Wade the Supreme Court has ever issued. Um, so sometimes in dissent, you get the, the best arguments on behalf of a particular side that the justice is taking. Now in none of these cases did the Supreme Court recent decision simply come out of the blue. For decades, Roe versus Wade has been the topic of heated debate, with some noted liberal law professors conceding that the court's reasoning was embarrassingly weak. A few, few years ago, for example, a number of prominent law professors wrote a book with the title, What Roe versus Wade Should Have Said, because they didn't think what it did say was very convincing. The Supreme Court's abortion decisions were never unanimous, and its explanation for the right to privacy uh, that it found in the penumbras of the 14th Amendment shifted over time. Fifteen years ago, the court indicated it would no longer completely ignore the troublesome Second Amendment. Even gun control enthusiasts, I will say I'm a gun control enthusiast, must admit that, there is a, that when a constitutional amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed, that must mean something. Exactly why I'm not sure, but it can't simply be ignored. Nor is the so-called major question in administrative law really so new. For decades, indeed I'd say for two centuries, um, the court has gone back and forth on the extent to which administrative agencies should be able to define their own power. Um, most, peop most citizens, I think, probably think that major political questions should be resolved by Congress and not by administrative agencies. Of course, where to draw the line between a major question and a subsidiary question is pretty difficult, and that's what the Supreme Court is trying to do right now. Yes, this, the current Supreme Court has been changing directions as a result of recent judicial appointments. But if you look behind the rhetoric, you'll see that this is hardly a revolution. Although we would not, uh, you would not know it from media accounts, uh, very few Supreme Court decisions break down a strictly left-right line. And some of the more conservative justices, especially Thomas and Alito, sometimes find themselves in the minority. So if you want to change the minds of lower court judges, or state officials, or future justices, or average citizens, you need to be able to explain why the majority on the court got it wrong, why it got it wrong. You need to present counter arguments. Engaging this sort of debate, this type of debate, increases your chances of modifying public opinion and, I think most importantly, confirms your commitment to constitutional government. Decrying court decisions as abnormal, or corrupt, or extreme, or unprincipled might be a very good fundraising tactic but it reduces your chances of nudging judges in your preferred direction, 
It more seriously undermines respect for judicial independence, the rule of law, and the Constitution. So let me close just by emphasizing that liberal constitutional democracy rests on this delicate set of institutional norms, expectations, and, and arrangements. We must fu somehow find a way uh, to avoid the scylla of populist majoritarianism, commonly known as Trumpism these days, and the charybdis of rule by unaccountable, unelected judges and administrators. To preserve these institutions, we must have the freedom to criticize what judges do. Indeed, we often have the obligation to do so. But we must seek to criticize and oppose them in ways that respect our governing institutions and recognize that we can disagree without questioning each other's motives or the legitimacy of their actions. This is a delicate balance, but it's an essential one. And that's one of the things we need to respect remember on Constitution Day. Thank you. Looking for hands. Who's going to ask the first question? Um, so, I feel like we often hear that the Supreme Court is called like the supreme law of the land. And so do you think by stating that like the Supreme Court can't be the sole interpreter of the Constitution that that undermines this level of supremacy that we learn about? That's, an interesting, that's a good question. Um, let me make a couple of uh, distinctions. First of all, the, the, the argument I was making about the responsibility of the President and Congress to interpret the Constitution is often called departmentalism. Um, it's a fancy academic word for something that you can all readily understand. The Constitution says that the Constitution and the laws of the United States are the supreme law of the land. It doesn't say that the Supreme Court is the supreme interpreter of, uh, of the Constitution. Um, so, and, and I just, I think pragmatically, I think it's important to think uh, get a sense of how these things really work in practice, the Supreme Court doesn't decide a lot of issues. And when it does, it often decides them in, uh, only in quite a vague way. That was one of the themes I was trying to develop. Um, so uh, what we need to do is find a way that we don't want people simply to disregard what the Supreme Court says or defy a court order. But we have to keep in mind the fact that this job of interpretation is for all the branches of, of government. Um, and is there a possible conflict between those two things? Absolutely. That's what, I, that's what Lincoln wrestled with. That's what other presidents have wrestled with. Um, but in the run-of-the-mill case, the idea that, um, that uh, we have many interpreters of the Constitution that is a really fundamental feature of American politics generally. I'll just, um, the, uh, my, my, one of my teachers, James Q. Wilson, said that there um, had a metaphor for American politics that I often use in my class. He said, in Britain, you have uh, politics is like a, a heavyweight fight. You know, you got the two parties up there, and uh, you know, they, they duke it out, and then one rules. He's a heavyweight champion for the next several years. Now, these days in British politics, some of the heavyweight, ch some of the champions seem to fade immediately when they get into the arena, but that's another issue. But he said, American politics is like a, a, a barroom brawl. You know, people, everyone is going at it. You don't know who's on what side. Um, people use any uh, tool available. They use a gun, a knife, a chair, a bottle, anything, and it spills out into the street um, it's never over. That's the, the bottom line. In American politics, these issues are never over. So there is always a way to contest what you disagree with, but there should be certain rules that you apply to, which is to, in, to respect the other institution and not defy direct court orders. I don't, you want to follow up? 
How would you intend to um, carry out like the um, laws that like people don't follow? Like if it comes down to like the police officers who don't agree with things, like how would yeah. you ever control like anything if you can't control the people who make them? Yeah, I mean that's uh, everyone here the question: How do you control these highly discretionary actions by people who are supposed to be subject to Supreme Court or uh, lower court rulings? And I, yeah, um, take the police. We have all kinds of rules established, especially during a war in court, about how you conduct searches, when you can stop and frisk. Um, the truth is that when you get down to the bottom, to the level of the individual cop, um, until we had body camps, no one was watching what was going on. Um, and uh, so it, Governing what happens at that level is extremely hard. Uh, that's why I would say that you've got to, you can't put too much emphasis on rules in many of these circumstances. That's the limit of, of, of the court's power. Because in order to get the type of behavior by highly discretionary officials, like police or like teachers, you have to build a culture within the organization. Um, and I think that one of the big lessons of efforts to try to control police discretion is the importance of building a particular type of organization and not expecting that they're just going to uniformly apply the rules. Um, like, I feel like from what I've gathered, I feel as though like the um, Supreme, Supreme Court justice, the presence, everything, like the whole law judicial system, everything is pretty much um, corrupt, but now we just like know about it more. Like I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that because I've, that's just what I've gathered from it. Sure, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm glad you, you asked that question. I, I did a discussion like this with my brother-in-law not too recently. He said, do you think this is the most corrupt Supreme Court we've ever had? And I said, I don't think it's corrupt. I think you, there are differences of opinion about what, how you interpret the Constitution. Um, did Clarence Thomas probably take too many benefits from wealthy people? Yeah, I actually think that his wife should not be so engaged in partisan politics. Do I think that had any effect whatsoever on Clarence Thomas's decisions? No. Clarence Thomas has very clear, very, I would say, principled decisions. Sometimes I think he is too principled. He will stick to some of these positions um, in a way which I think leads him to some um, odd results. But do a, is that corruption? No, that's a disagreement among the justices about how to read the Constitution and how to read statutes. Do you want to, since you, you, you think that they, the corruption is there, say a little bit more about why. I'm curious about this. I honestly don't know. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, okay, well, I, don't, I now know, don't know who to trust, what to think, all that stuff. Yeah. Because apparently it was corrupt the whole time, and now we just know more about it. Right. Uh, yeah. that, I think that's a very good statement because of what popular culture is telling us, what the media is telling us. I would just say that I, I read uh, that Matt Gates said uh, the other day that, um, that the, the Speaker of the House is a lying dead dog. And I must have, I, I puzzled over that. I said, can dogs lie, especially if they're dead? Um, so I did, but you know, we'll just throw any epithet out. Um, and, but I think that the, the, the antidote to that that you're hearing all the time is go read those decisions. Um, you might disagree strenuously with Clarence Thomas's understanding of how to read the Constitution, but it has nothing to do with what trips he took. Um, and uh, do I, is it po probably what we should do is to have clearer rules about what justices can accept. Ethics rules, that would be great because I think it would address some of your concerns. Would it affect how the Supreme Court decides cases? I don't think so. Uh, 
Let me just say that one of the things that I would, that's very odd about the Supreme Court that uh, I think probably some of you will be, if you're interested in going to law school, will find interesting is the most, one of the most important things the Supreme Court does is decide which cases to hear. So it decides only about 100 cases per year. It gets several thousand requests for review. Who decides basically what case it's going to hear? Believe it or not, it is recent law graduates who are serving as law clerks um, who make these decisions with very little guidance from the Supreme Court. People who have had no experience in the real world. Um, people who have gone to the best law schools, um, so think they're really smart. Um, and uh, that strikes me as a very odd way to decide what the Supreme Court should hear. And if I were going to change something about the way the Supreme Court operates, I'd change that before I change the ethics rules. Um, so I just had a question about like when um, bringing in a new uh, justice on the Supreme Court and the questioning process they go through. I feel like recently we see a lot of um, the questions being directed towards like trying to get ahead on what a future ruling might be mm -hmm. and like politically affiliated rather than just on fairness. So I was wondering what your thoughts on um, in terms of saying that when we go after the Supreme Court, it's usually after the fact, looking at a court, looking at a decision, and litigating or passing legislation after the fact. What about people trying to get ahead of it before they're actually on the court? Like, is that also a fair route? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important question. Um, so let me just say a couple things. I think one of the reasons that there is a sense among Democrats uh, that there's something illegitimate about the current court is the way that the last two justices on the Supreme Court were chosen. Um, and they have very, I think, very legitimate criticisms. Because when President Obama was in his last year, he made a nominee, uh, nomination that the Republicans in the Senate completely ignored. Um, and they said, well, we should wait for the next presidential election. Then when um, Trump was in his last year in office, he made a uh, a nomination, and they sped it through very quickly. Now, that's, if you, that strikes you as unfair, you're right. It is quite unfair. Um, the other thing that makes people concerned is the way in which uh, these nomination hearings have been held. Um, there, there are two sets of questions that have basically been focused on. One is um, on the judge's judicial philosophy. Um, I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, what kind of judge are you going to be? Um, how do you understand your job to interpret the Constitution? How do you understand your, your job to interpret statutes? I think we've been too lenient in allowing uh, nominees to slide off those questions, say, ma'am, I'm just going to call balls and strikes, and that's all there is to it, and everyone, really, everyone knows that's not true. Or they'll say, you know, that question might come up before the Supreme Court, so I, don't, I shouldn't decide it because I might, I might prejudice myself. If someone is being nominated for the Supreme Court and doesn't know where they stand on um, the type of interpretation that led to Roe versus Wade, then they probably shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. Um, and if they say they've never thought about it, they're not telling you the truth. Um, but why did they do that? And the answer is Robert Bork. Robert Bork in 1986, the leading legal scholar of his time, submitted to all kinds of questions and engaged this long dialogue about how to interpret the Constitution, including with Joe Biden. Um, you won't be surprised that Joe Biden used most of his questioning time talking rather than listening. Um, but it, it was a really interesting dialogue. But many, justice, uh, many senators said, well, we didn't like his answer or how he's going to come down in this case or this case or this case, and they voted him down. So every subsequent nominee said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pretend that I haven't thought about these issues or wouldn't be appropriate for these issues. Um, that, I think, is, takes away from the type of constitutional discussion and dialogue that we should be having. Now, the other issue that has come up in most of these, these hearings is, if you can't kind of tie, you know, pin people down on constitutional or statutory issues, attack them personally. Um, so you try to dig up dirt on them. Um, 
and that's what has often been the focus of, of Supreme Court nomination hearings, and that's why we often think that there's something corrupt in the process. So that's a, that's a problem. I'm going to follow up actually a little bit. Thank, thank you very much. Th thank you very much for, for this talk. I really appreciate a, a lot of what you're saying. Um, I kind of want to follow up with the question from down in the front. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I had a, a group of students in my DWC class, and we were talking about you know government and everything, and I said, uh, I said, um, well, if, if you want to change something in your society, how do you change it? Okay, when I was a kid, you would say, well, you pass a law. You, you, hmm. the, the little PBS thing, you know, what's a bill and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and it just seemed so obvious to me that, you know, that the, the, the route would be legislative and, as you said, you know, discussion and debate, et cetera, et cetera. And almost all of my students said, demonstrate. Huh. And I, I really pressed them on that because I was, I was so taken aback that that was, that was their answer, was to was demonstrate. And it kind of came out at the time and I think it's probably even stronger now, that there were basically two sides. There were those who were somewhat cynical that you could do anything because you can't trust the politicians you elect to represent you fairly um, in Congress. Um, and it was too difficult to even to understand some of the issues. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, you know, read the, um, to read the, the, um, uh, the cases, but that takes a lot of time, <laughs> it takes a lot of concentration, even when you're done, you're not sure you understood everything. Um, I mean, you know, I think, I'm afraid that young people are becoming really cynical and, you know, disillusioned um, as to what, what's even possible. I know this is not the first time in the history of the country that's happened, but, I mean, what, what would you recommend about that? Because, you know, my students were like, well, maybe if we scream really loud, um, you know, they'll, they'll do what we want them to do. And, uh, and uh, again, I was really, I was really shocked by that, um, that that was the response, so. Good. Thank you. Um, I graduated from high school in 1969, um, so I'm all in favor of protesting and demonstrating. Um, I went to a lot of anti-war protests, I went to a lot of uh, protests of a variety of sorts, but I think what's happened in American politics since then is that we've gotten very good at announcing our preferences um, in social media or in demonstrations. What we've, what we've become much less good at is joining with other people over the long run to affect some longer term change. Um, and this, I, here it's, I point to the work of Bob Putnam on social capital that articulating complaints has gotten easier, joining together with other human beings um, to, to, to seek some, an organizational promote long-term change, that has gotten much harder. Um, and we see models of this kind of, uh, you know, expressing our anger all the time on the right and the left. Right now, I'd say it's particularly disturbing on the right. Um, but. Uh, we don't see as many models of, uh, let's work together in a common cause. Um, you know, look at Congress, how often does that happen? You know, they're not exactly great role models for us. But I do have actually one suggestion. You know, how can we try to reverse this a bit? Um, it is easier to do that at the more local level. So if you really want to change something, your chances of changing something, your chances of actually getting an organization to have some influence is at the local level or a bit at the state level, depending on where you live. Fortunately, Rhode Island's a very small state. Um, and your chance of affecting uh, what happens in the legislature is pretty significant. I live in New Hampshire, um, and uh, I was surprised. Just yesterday there was a special election, and the size of the partisan difference in the house in the house split is now 200 to 200. So you know, changing one seat can change the balance of power in the legislature. And that's not typical, but it does say that the more local the politics, the more your chances are of actually changing something. Um, and learning that the other side is not necessarily evil or corrupt. They might have a good argument. They might not, but they might. <laughs>
Just want to say thank you. Oh, that's loud. Just want to say thank you for coming out. I thought it was great what you said about um, you need to explain why you want what you want, or you're not going to get anywhere. Um, my question for you is: In Civ, we talked about how the original Constitution tried to put the hands, uh, the power in the hands of the people by having the uh, House of Representatives bring forth the budget, and now I think the president does that. Yeah. And um, in in your talk, you talked about how we're we shouldn't just focus on what uh, the Supreme Court says and their interpretation of the Constitution. I was wondering if you thought there should be someone who does have like final say, like which branch should have final say in you know, what the law is and what the interpretation of the Constitution is and who that is and why. <laughs> should we have someone have the final say? Um, I suppose that if I could give a Hamiltonian and Madisonian answer to that. Hamilton would want energy in the executive. You'd have one final say. Madison would say, no, what you really want to do is you have a plurality of points of view and you make ambition counteract ambition. And I gotta say in that I'm much more Madisonian. Number one, um, it won't work. Because we, in, the, in, in the United States, this, this is a really big, really diverse country where we have powerful state governments and in, uh, influential local governments. Um, we have lots of competing media. Um, we have congressmen uh, and congresswomen who think that they have an important role to play. Um, so the idea that you could actually do that, um, I think, is extremely unlikely. Um, and um, on top of that, do you really want to have these issues be resolved finally and without any question? I'd like the questioning to continue on most of these issues. Um, but you know, there are some pretty severe problems with, with doing it that way. Um, it's really hard to have a final decision on anything. I mean, let me just take Obamacare. Obamacare passed in 2010, um, and then there was litigation on it for the next several years, and then there was question about whether the states would implement it, which states would implement it. So people who are, who are wondering whether they're going to be eligible for various elements of Obamacare were left uncertain for many, many years. Providers were left uncertain. That is one of the great problems with our American political system. And it strikes me that is one of the unavoidable costs of this more pluralistic system that spreads power pretty broadly. Uh, uh, so I was hoping, hoping you could help me understand the Israeli situation a little bit better, which you uh, alluded to at the beginning. Right? My understanding is that the issue is over this something like a, a reasonableness principle. Um, and so what do you think of that, and to what extent other uh, legal systems in the world have maybe de facto something like a reasonableness principle without formalizing it? Sure, yeah. First, you know, I, I used to spend a lot of time studying administrative law, but I've never studied Israel very carefully. So I'll try to give you my best answer to that. And anyone here who has a better understanding of what's going on in Israel should feel free to chime in. So um, a couple of odd things about the judiciary in Israel. Um, one is the so-called reasonable standard, which is that basically any administrative decision that they think is unreasonable, they can invalidate. Um, what does re you know, we, we differ a lot on what is reasonable. I've got to say that, that in, while there's a lot of concern about excessive administrative authority in the United States, courts in this country have never taken that extreme a position. That's a pretty extreme position. The other thing that's odd about the Israeli courts is they will strike down laws as unconstitutional despite the fact they don't have a constitution. Okay, that seems a little odd. I think it's a little bit odd. Um, so by any American standard, um, if you said, does the Israeli court have too much power, I think almost everyone say, we wouldn't want that here. That would be too powerful a judiciary. But here's, here's, here's what I would say, but. 
why are so many people in Israel so upset about this effort to try to reduce the power of the court? Partly it is because they see this reasonable standard question as the opening wedge in a much broader attack on the courts. But I would say that in Israel you have a parliamentary system. You have an extremely narrow majority um, that is really some of the kind of more extreme parties are calling the tune in that extremely narrow uh, majority. There are no other checks and balances on the power of that narrow majority in Israel. Um, so I think the sense is that if you didn't have the courts as a check on, on that narrow majority, there would be no checks. Um, and I think that's a very powerful argument. Uh, the United States, we're talking about, we have so many checks, we might have too many. Uh, in that system, I think they, uh, they have to rely on the courts for any limitation on the power of the narrow majority. And I, get, I would just add that I gather that a lot of the issue is about what kind of country is Israel going to be. Um, this is not, we, we often, I, I, I kind of get sick of people saying there's an existential threat. But I think that this really is an existential issue for the state of Israel. Are we a, a liberal, constitutional, secular democracy, or are we kind of uh, a religious, a fundamentally religious country? Um, and that's what this is, battle is really about. Anyone who knows more about Israel, feel free to correct everything I've said. Hi, um, thank you for coming today and for your talk. We really appreciate it. Um, my question is, um, what cases are you personally like looking at that you think are going to be really important to like the last couple cases you mentioned on affirmative action, abortion, gun control? What what's coming up? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I'm afraid I'm going to give a really boring answer. Um, I think that the most important questions the court is going to be facing in the next several years have to do with administrative power and presidential power for the reason that right now, um, and, and off and on, basically for many, many years, we've had divided government. Um, we've had uh, one party controlling one or both houses of Congress, the other the presidency. So um, presidents can't get they, what they want through legislation. We used to say, you know, pass a law, really hard to pass laws these days. Um, or when you do pass a law, as say Obama, President Obama did um, in 2009, 2010, you have to pack everything in there, um, do everything you can when you have that little window, and you can't change much of it. So presidents have a very strong incentive to get what they want, not through legislation, but through unilateral administrative action. Um, you have Congress and the president at odds. Who's going to decide who can make those decisions? It's going to, those issues are going to end up in court. Um, and the extent to which the president can um, cancel uh, student debt, can um, stop, uh, put a moratorium on evictions, can build walls along the Mexican border, can issue Muslim bans, can, um, can do all of these things involving immigration, can um, make dreamers uh, eligible for citizenship. All these things, some of them are good, some of them are bad, but the big question about whether that is something a president or an administrative agency can do, that's a really major issue, but it usually comes to the court in relatively boring form. Um, so I think our job of some of us is to explain why these issues are really important. We have one more question, and then we'll give room. We'll take it from there. Hi, um, thank you for coming today. And um, I, my question is just, what are your thoughts on the leaking of the Dobbs case and like how they never really um, investigated that and how that has contributed to like criticisms of the legitimacy of the court? That's, a, that's an interesting one. I think yeah. they really did seriously investigate it, but they didn't figure out who did it. <laughs> I mean, I think. We could say, you know, some law clerk did it. But what's the bigger issue here? Um, the bigger issue is crumbling of institutional norms. Um, you see this in extreme form in Congress. You know, just 
people behave in Congress these days in ways that they never would have in the days of Tip O'Neill. I'm the Tip O'Neill professor at, at Boston College, so Tip is one of my heroes. Um, you know, he, there was a sense of decorum, that you had a loyalty not just to your constituency and not just to your party, but you had it to the institution of Congress. Um, that has certainly waned significantly in Congress. I mean, this, guy, this senator from Alabama who's held up 300 Pentagon appointments on an issue of abortion. You know, this is not a, abortion, uh, you know, it might be important, but it's not the major issue involving a defense policy. But he has really endangered the, the, the national defense um, on this one issue, and one senator has been allowed to do that. In the old days, he would have been so ashamed that he wouldn't have done it. And I think what you're seeing with the leaking of uh, the Dobbs decision is the weakening of those commitments to institutional norms. Um, because the issue is too important to let these mere institutional norms uh, uh, guide our behavior. Um, and that is, you know, the, the court is, has been the last institution affected by that, but you can see it, unfortunately, there as well. Can we have one more question? <laughs> I have the mic, so I'm, can I ask you just a quick follow-up for this, and then we'll go to um, the next one. Can you say that again? You're convinced, oh, okay. you're convinced that the, there was a real investigation? Because I suspect most people in the room, including myself, do not believe that. So, but you're pretty confident there was a real investigation? <laughs> or you just think there was? I'm, I guess I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything. It's that's just my reflex. That, that, that's interesting, because um, do I, what evidence do I have? Um, John Roberts said so. <laughs> so um, I suppose a lot of it is, what, what's our default position, right? Our default position, I think, I'm willing to say that people, take people at their word, um, uh, unless they have some reason not to. Um, but I might be completely wrong. I had no inside information on this. So you might be right. And your default position is the default position of the American public. My theory is that it, uh, it, they found out it was a justice. <laughs> Liberal or conservative, I don't think they would tell on them. Um, so I was looking at your, uh, the title of your talk, and if I had looked at it in June, I would have assumed this was going to be a conversation about what do the Democrats do in this, in this kind of climate where there's a very conservative court and they're trying to figure out how to um, you know, have some relevance in that, um, in that world. But when I looked at it this week, I thought immediately of the Milligan decision that happened that is that's kind of unfold, unfolding in Alabama, right? So uh, uh, Ro Ro John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh joined the liberals to uphold a, a district court holding about the Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. a violation of the Voting Rights Act in Alabama that they essentially required Alabama to draw another majority minority in Alabama. That means majority black district, um, which is which everyone was a little bit surprised at because the, the Roberts Court's general posture toward uh, redistricting and toward the Voting Rights Act, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now it seems as if the conservatives in Alabama are refusing to redraw the map in an appropriate way. And uh, I just kind of wondered what your thoughts were on that. We have conservatives resisting a conservative court. I'm sure that they thought they were going to win. Um, but so I was just kind of curious about that circumstance. Yeah, that really is an interesting case. And I'd say that, you know, if you say what are some of the important issues come up, um, you know, there are going to be a lot of important voting rights cases involved in redistricting. Um, and the, the way that the justices decide those cases is not nearly as predictable as we might think. Um, it turns out that the two members of re Republican appointees who are most likely to defect are Roberts and Kavanaugh. And of course, Kavanaugh was the one who probably had the most brutal hearing. Um, in, you know, in some ways, this is just such a typical case. I mean, you could go back to the 1960s and you'd say, well, of course, the, the state legislature in Alabama is going to, is going to um, uh, try to... Uh, uh, it won't follow the court ruling. I mean, if you, 
if you follow anything about the civil rights era, the amount of southern obstinacy and downright non-compliance is remarkable. I mean, we've had this more recently. Some of you might remember Judge is it Roy Moore, who basically was told, take the, 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 the um, this statue, this statute or monument with the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse, and he wouldn't do it. Um, but fortunately, I say, fortunately, what do you do in that case? In that case is a pretty easy answer, which is, okay, legislature, you won't do it. The court will do it for you. Um, so it is likely that the district court will draw the lines. Um, so in those cases, I think that what you do when the Supreme, when, when there's noncompliance is, there are many things the court can do directly. Not the Supreme Court, but the lower courts. Um, but um, it, it, it really depends, I'd say, on how centralized the decision is. In this case, there's one decision. How are you going to draw this map? As opposed to the police that we're talking about, where there are tens of thousands, millions of decisions every day. Um, but I think that case shows, number one, that uh, the conservatives on the court aren't united. And number two, that in some instances, um, I think everyone in the federal judicial system and everyone in the federal government will agree, you can't let them get away with this. Um, the other, actually, I just lay one other thing about um, uh, talking about the relationship between Congress um, uh, and, and the Supreme Court. Um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, the Supreme Court issued a couple of cases that said, basically, we're not going to get involved in the job of determining what is a racially fair districting process. Um, Congress, in 1982, rewrote the Civil Rights Act to say, yes, that is a matter under the Civil Rights, uh, the Voting Rights Act, and that is a job the court should undertake. So sometimes you get um, the court saying, no, no, we don't want that job. That's too difficult. We don't like that. But Congress saying, yes, you need to do that. And Congress has done that um, for the last uh, 40 years. So we hope that um, you'll be able to head next door to get some refreshments with us. And we hope you'll give a very warm round of applause to Professor Melnick. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.